Well, welcome everyone. Thank you very much for coming tonight to one of our first in a series of um, artist lectures brought to you by the Art Alliance for Contemporary Glass. Casey Einhorn organized all of these, and uh, Jen Stevenson has been doing the promotion on this, so we've got a wonderful turnout, and I'm really glad for that. So I hope some of you are familiar with West Hunting already, and we'll have this opportunity to learn a little bit more about his work and the progression of his work. Uh, and if you don't, you're in for a wonderful treat. I've known Wes probably since uh, about 1990, I think, um, but uh, this journey together has been really a wonderful learning process. So first, um, uh, I'm the executive director of uh, the museum at this point in time. I got to know Wes when, when I was the curator here, and we, we were just starting to explore contemporary glass a little bit. So um, this has been a wonderful opportunity to see some of the Wisconsin artists um, work in the material that they do and have them within such close proximity. So I'm glad to have Wes share his knowledge and his um, breadth of experience um, since 1975, he told me, when he was working in um, Illinois and started the first studio in downtown Chicago. He uh, had also worked at the Art Institute uh, of Chicago with Kent Ibsen, a piece that we have on view uh, down here, in the early parts of the studio glass movement. So progressed, uh, stayed in Chicago for about eight years, but then moved on up and settled in Wisconsin and has been uh, working up here since. So please help me welcome Wes Hunting. Good evening. My name is Wes Hunting, and I have a glass problem. Hi, Wes. many of you do. Um, okay, well, I'm going to go through this basic thing that I put together. I was, I was kind of debating what I was going to do here, and I decided uh, to go through my whole, uh, what kind of a retrospect of my work. So I, I have a way that is organized, and um, I, I get really long-winded sometimes, and I talk on and on and on without completing a, a full thought, uh, as my son will testify to that. But, um, so this is basically going to be, uh, my career started in, in glass around uh, 1975, when I first started uh, blowing glass. And I didn't start at a university uh, level or anything like that. I was kind of working as a groundskeeper at this place called Hale Homestead, which is an early American village in uh, Ohio, right by the uh, Akron Kent State area. And uh, I was a groundskeeper there. I, I started school as a uh, painter. I, I was studying painting at the university. And that's what I decided what I was going to do was be a, a painter. Well, I had this job there, and uh, I was mowing lawns. And one day it was like a ye old American village. It was kind of like Jamestown, New York. I don't know if you're familiar with that. But, it, you know, we'd, we'd do this, uh, wear a smock, and, you know, they had uh, ye old potter and uh, the uh, butter churner chip, and, you know, <laughs> you know, all that kind of early American ye old this and ye old that. And, you know. and uh, so I'm mowing lawns on this hill. And there was these two glass blowers. Um, I don't know if any of you are familiar, probably a few of you, there's this guy Shorty, who was a very well-known glass blower for Fenton Art Glass. He was like their top gatherer. He'd go up there in the summer, he liked the area, and one day he just got fed up with the administration there at this early American village and quit. Just walked off. He, you know, he was, he was uh, Shorty was a great guy and you know, really wonderful glass blower, amazing for the time. 
And so he left, and uh, the administrator said, you know, you on the hill, mowing the lawn, get down here. <laughs> and uh, so I helped, uh, I helped his assistant, Shorty's assistant, for Wes once. And it worked out pretty good. I mean, I didn't know what I was doing. The assistant didn't know what he was doing. So we went through this whole thing. And we kind of faked it. You know, we were sticking honeys in the molten glass. And everyone was going, oh, and everyone was going, oh my god, that's incredible. You, know, you have to understand the, the time here. There was no, no hot glass at that time. That no, one, no one's seen this except in big scale factories. So I really got into it. And um, we, had, we could make three objects out of mug a snuff bottle, and what was the other thing? He, he made the stemmer. I, I wasn't well enough to do that, good enough to do that. But um, anyway, so I, first time I did it, I was just like overwhelmed by it. It's like, this is the most incredible stuff I've ever worked with. So I ended up, just happens that at Kent State University, where I was going to school, they had a, it was one of the few schools at the time that actually taught hot glass under the direction of Henry Hale. And, uh, so I got involved with it, just blew me away, you know, so I started taking courses there. So um, I've always, to that point, I drew since I was a child. I always did little, you know, I don't know, it was like doing sketches of you know, um, spacemen and spaceships and army men and tanks and all that stuff that young boys at that time were totally into. You know? And uh, I used to fantasize uh, is how I spent my time. The other kids were, you know, running around the woods with sticks. I, I'd sit there and draw, 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 draw. You know, in my little fantasy world. And my parents thought I was insane, I think, but you know, they, they backed it. And um, so in 1975, I, you know, I went to KSU, and that was a wonderful experience. Um, this is a, this is the kind of painting. I should go back. Right, here's the studio at Kent, 1970, 1975. Um, basic everything, you know, I mean, this is the way we built it. Mick, Mick will tell you about it. <laughs> this is the way it was. We didn't have any fancy furnaces, or, you know, we, we basically kind of knew what we were doing, I think, but did we? Yeah, kind of. <laughs> we faked it real well. But, um, but this is what a, a 1975 studio was like, which was uh, pretty good. I mean, this is a sophisticated uh, home studio, or you know, student studio at the time. Go ahead. And uh, this is the kind of painting I was doing at the time. Um, I, like I said, I started a painting, uh, you know, the, a painting, a painter. That's what I wanted to do. And so I was doing all these very um, elongated figures, kind of very abstract. Uh, very dark, dismal kind of approach. You know, Charles Bukowski I was reading, and, you know, very uh, kind of, I wasn't in a bad place, but I think that a lot, a lot of youth goes through that time period when they're thinking dark thoughts and, you know. Next. Another one, you know, it's like, uh, but you know, the interesting thing about these is, this is before I even started working in glass, is uh, all these, these vessel shapes are everywhere in my paintings. And they kind of continue on to that form to this day. Uh, it's very loose, kind of uh, small bases, very uh, floating, uh, very linear. And, you know, I just kind of dug these up later. I haven't seen these for a while. But, you know, just kind of dark things like see the fire in the background, you know, out the window, and you know, it's like. Uh, and these these are quite these canvases are. Probably like five by five, six by six. Uh, go ahead. So, after I uh, went through my uh, learning stage, as my assistant Tammy will tell you, you know, you make a lot of cups and you make a lot of everything to learn how to blow glass. And I was doing that at Hill Village, Hill Homestead, making these mugs. So we make fifty of them in a day, day after day after day after day after day. So you know, my my uh, I think it was getting you know my. My skills were getting better. And then I started experimenting trying to paint on glass with colored glass. I never liked the way the enamels looked. I was like, they looked like, why don't I just do a painting? You know, or I, I look at uh, sandblasted things. It's like, well, why don't I do them in clay, you know? 
I see a lot of that in work these days, contemporary work. I, I, I still have that, and I don't know if that's good or not, but I still look at pe people, other people's work and I'm like, it's good, but it's like, I just don't understand if you're not using glass for the optic quality, why not do it in another material that's a thousand times easier? Glass is a very difficult material. <coughs> You know, and uh, so I started kind of drawing these, and these were hand torch with a thread of glass and hand torch them from the reverse side and then open up into these platter kind of things next. And then I sandblast them and leave behind to kind of, you know, for the optics in the back. Go ahead. You can start going through these pretty fast. And I decided that the, the, I didn't want to put them on a vessel. This is all this is college work, so I mean, it gets better. <laughs> plus, plus these images, you know, I, I took these in my bedroom, you know, in my dorm room or something, with a crappy camera. Okay, next. These were wall pieces that I did, I, but I blow a, a, a cylinder and then open it up. This is very inspired by Henry Halen. This is what my instructor was doing at the time. So I'd open up these sheets and then slump on top of them and, you know, just really learning how to manipulate the material in different ways besides just blowing or hot work. Go ahead. And there's Henry. This is a recent photo from, uh, was that last year we went there? Uh, this was, yeah. And this is Henry's 80th birthday party. We all, and all the students got there. I think there was about 10 of us, but four of us took this because we were, this is the main floor when I was there. Um, uh, Yankee, me, Jose Chartier, and uh, Hard Tommy. And there's Henry pointing towards something because he was this comical kind of guy. <laughs> um, so after I got done with school, I went to Italy. I decided I was really interested in the Millefiori marine process, as you see, outstanding collection of this museum. And I really wanted to learn. I worked at that point with uh, Richard Ritter, uh, Dick Marquis, uh, that was the nice thing about Kent State, it's like we had all these guys that were Henry's friends coming through, you know, I worked with Barbara Lepofsky, like every single, everybody. And then I went down to Penland and I worked with every single Harvey Littleton, you know, it's like just everybody down there, you know, which was like unbelievable experience. I spent uh, about six months working for Richard Ritter down there and I was his TA twice and uh, Richard's a master and, and uh, Richard Ritter's a master in Bill Fiore. Uh, Dick Marquis is a good friend of mine. He's he's one of the masters. So I, I kind of studied with the both, you know, with the best. And uh, Dick Marquis told me, he goes, you got to go to Italy. So you got to experience it. That's, that's where it's at. So I actually went there for three months and I ended up working at the Vidini factory, which I had my camera stolen, so I stole this off the internet. But this is, <laughs> this is basically uh, the Vidini factory around that time period or close to it. Uh, go ahead. Then I moved to Chicago, and uh, my wife at the time, uh, got a, uh, she was a performance artist, and she got a job teaching at the Chicago Art Institute. And uh, I moved there with, you know, with her, so I was ready to set up my own studio. I never went to graduate school, I just didn't have the money to do it, and my, my all thought here process was, I'd rather take that money and put it towards building a studio. So for $5,000, it's incredible. I built my the first studio in downtown Chicago. The way I did this was I used to drive up and down this, uh, every Sunday. People would throw their their stuff out in their their in, in the middle of the alley, and I'd go back and forth and back and forth with my van. I had this big yellow Econoline van. Lucky I didn't get arrested for being a pervert or something. <laughs> but I used to go back and forth and back and forth. And, and I would use uh, bed frames for angle iron. I made scrap material like that. And I finally piled it into this old milk. Um, it was my first studio. Was a, it was a, it housed milk trucks back in the 40s, I think, 50s. And then it was abandoned. And uh, so I rented it for cheap and I built my studio there. And uh, this is my first studio. And, uh, this is this is a great picture. I mean, this is, uh, this is biggest bed. Biggest bed. <laughs> The reason, because my stuff got really large anyways, but um, at the time, for the time, but uh, you know, it's like we didn't have a lot of glass. I think held, I think 150 pounds. And I blew glass out of there for about eight years. I you know, built the furnace a couple times, a small invested crucible pot. And, but this is the street that it was on and it was really great. Um, 
Uh, there's a picture of the peerless confectionery, and I used to love that because I lived on the street next door to it, but just across the way. And uh, so they, it was a confectionery company that made Christmas candies and small hard candies. So some days you'd walk out in the morning and go to work, and I was, you know, the whole place smelled like root beer. <laughs> and the next day, oops, and the, the next day you'd walk out and the whole place smelled like strawberries. It was, like, it was always like this really bizarre kind of thing, sensory thing. Uh, but this train would go by once in a while. And there's, there's the oven. Go ahead, go ahead. Next. All right, there's my oven and my warm gloves. And there you go ahead. That was, that was the idea of that. And then I continued. These, these pieces developed. <laughs> You can go ahead. And they got more and more detailed and see the buildings in the background. And, I, and I, I started enjoying the way, it's hard to see these pieces because it's such bad photography, but you know, as I spun them, the whole thing would kind of move. So you could make this really interesting figure, like stick figure, and by spinning it, it would kind of change shape, you know, and, and give emotion to these figures, which I really enjoyed. Go ahead. And those weren't selling at all. <laughs> and I had this incredible gas bill. So I started making these. And Nick and I were just talking about this glass. Uh, I somehow obtained, I think it was through Nick actually, and I have no idea how it worked. We're trying to figure that out. But it was a milk glass. And I, I really, really, it was very soft and gooey. So I started doing these pieces. I, I was kind of influenced on Jehuli's uh, pieces at that point. I worked with Dale at Kent State for a whole summer. Him and Bill Morris came in and you know they blew glass out of the KSU studio for a show they had at Habitat. And he was making, uh, it's when he first started developing the shell pieces, or I don't know what he calls them, that's the thread. Yeah. And then, uh, okay, next. And these are these kind of interesting. Now if you look at the side of this, you can see a vessel and uh, there's a table with a thing with flowers on it. And, Continue. And then we moved up to Wisconsin in 1986, I believe. And this is the house at the time, which uh, was, it was, uh, I got it for really cheap on 15 <laughs> acres of land, and I still live there today. But that's what it looks like. This is now. So it looks like Wisconsin, you know, it's like, man, could have gone anywhere. <laughs> but that's what it looks like in the summer. So there's a big, big difference. And I, I put the pond in, that's the house now, which I'm very proud of because I put a lot of my time in building the house. And, right? and that's the studio, and that's a, you know, my present studio, which is a great next door. I can walk there in my bathroom if I want. My furnace. I'll get through all this. It's probably a little long here, but go ahead. I'll do some shots in my studio when we work on a day like that. Go ahead. <laughs> these are some of the first. Now what I'm going to talk about is my color field vessels. It is like this piece right there. Okay, that's one from the 90s. Um, this is how they started out. I started using marini, and I kind of gave up the whole concept of doing drawings on them. I was using Italian techniques which I, in uh, a, a, a different way. It's always kind of the, I think, all the stuff that I learned from all these Italian masters and there at the time. And these pieces are uh, about 86. Go ahead. And you can flip through these pretty quickly. Right? So th th this is how they developed over the years. And you know, this is just to give you the, show you the growth. Um, uh, this is Richard Dreyfus. <laughs> and, uh, the reason I, I have this is because this, you know, encounters a, a third kind. Well, there's this thing in the, in the beginning of the movie starts where he's trying to find a form, and he doesn't quite know what he's looking for. And I think every artist kind of goes through, especially in the vessel, where you're, you're trying to make the perfect thing, but you don't exactly know what's going what's to happen. So, you know, I really studied the size of the base, the, the top of it, but I, I mean, the color field work, go ahead. These forms kind of changed on these. This, this piece was uh, early 90s, and it was actually purchased by, for the collection, permanent collection of the White House. Wow. So it's still there, as far as, well, who knows what's <laughs> 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 It's probably replaced by a gold 
Tapos ako na But I just am, I just show that you can go through these pretty fast. As you can see how they develop, I started making jars and using this design work on different pieces and you know seeing how it affected it. Yeah. I, I worked in this jar motif for a while. Go ahead. Yeah. What, was, what are the scales on these at the time? Uh, What's the size on these pieces? I, these are all very, not really recent. But, you know, they're probably about 16 to 18 inches tall. Yeah, I did this whole series of amphoras, going back to like uh, more Italian traditional shapes, I think. <laughs> I did these groupings for a while, and I, I really like this one. And these platters, but you know, I'm continually trying to find a different way to use this imagery that I'm working on to, you know, see how it works on different different shapes. Go ahead. <coughs> but this is the traditional shape, the, you know, this kind of V shape. And you know, it's like I, the size of the base in relationship to the width of the top. And some of these have gotten up to 28, 24 inches, I think we made, we made on there. Yeah, and uh, lots of marine, lots of design. And it's actually, a lot of people go and just throw this stuff on there. Oh no, it's like I, we lay it on at a table and I fuse it in and it's, it's, it's very, very worked out. So I know pretty much where everything is going to go. But then again, I like the sense of surprise, you know, because of what the glass does to it. Go ahead. Playing with the tops and curvatures and Life separation. That's weird. Anyways, these are all in perfect order. Right? <laughs> right, so here, here's a detail. And this is kind of what I'm mostly interested in is like painting on glass, you know, with glass. And some of the, you know, the, some of the detail is absolutely amazing. I don't think you could paint this. I, it's like this, but I really love about this technique. Okay, now this piece, this is interesting, this is going to end up the whole color field thing. Um, we were asked to do, we just got done with this huge commission for the Corning Museum. <coughs> we just finished in late September. They commissioned us to do uh, 90 pieces for uh, the corporate gifts for the Corning Corporation, which is a huge honor. I mean, it, you know, to little old me, you know, really. You know. And we were, uh, and like you said, oh, wow. Wow. but they had to be exact and really nice. And I mean, that's 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 some glass wall right there. <laughs> and make ninety of them that are exactly duplicates, so no one goes, "Well, I like this better because mine is." Anyways, I mean that was that was really nice. Yeah. <laughs> it's comic relief. <laughs> but he's not on side comic. Of course, you probably wouldn't know. That's Norman. Yeah. My buddy. The shop dog. The shop dog. <laughs> Had to put him in there. Yeah. <laughs> and of course, I'm just like, they're just scaling them up. <laughs> uh, yeah, right? Um, okay, then at, at one point, let me see, I gotta look at my notes because I'm, I'm old. Um, Alright, so, you know, this is, this is probably. Uh, 1996, I started uh, looking at teapots, and I collect teapots. I have literally probably about 100 teapots in my collection from ceramic art. So I'm really interested in ceramics, since more than actually more than glass, personally, uh, just because of the forms and the history. And uh, but I mean, the thing I like about tea, teapots, you have for these elements, you have the handle, the spout, and the center body and the lid. So there's four elements that you have to work with, and there's so much exploratory things you can do. So I started making these glass teapots, which uh, <laughs> these are all acid etched. And kind of thinking about that, there's four elements, there's four elements. You know, so 
and I kind of got away. There are Marines on the side that stand out. Um, but I kind of really got involved more about the shapes and my skull as a glass blower. Maybe, you know, these are kind of tr traditional Italian, except taken to the a whole different level, weird space, you know. I mean, because they're just objects that they would probably never make because they're so silly looking. But, um, you know, we, we, we did these for uh, quite a few years and they grew. Go ahead. And they were a lot of fun to make too. Yes, I mean, the, the, one, the one on the, the right is probably uh, maybe 14 inches tall. They're not really huge. Go ahead. And then they got huge. <laughs> These are uh, probably 30, 34 inches tall. And uh, I started carving into them. And this was done by layering color over the, like if you look at just the one section and sandblasting everything away. and uh, explored these quite a bit. They were a lot of fun. These, these are actually built, so they're, they're glued together. They're not, you know, they're epoxy together, but I, I had a lot of fun just making the individual parts and stacking them, and, which you will see later. Okay. But these got quite elaborate with all the little handles and weird stuff I was doing. This one actually, I don't know if you can see it because it's an old photograph. It was, uh, this, this is the one that I, I actually carved and polished the sphere. And then when I put those handles on it, it was, uh, yeah, it, it was heated up so it kind of fire polished, they call it. And inside that ball, there's stuff going on, which I don't have any photographs of, but it was like a, just a little tippy thing. But go ahead. <coughs> I think Rose Ann's got a nice one. Why is that that one? <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm only made two. <laughs> and I just made this one just for fun a couple, a couple, a couple of years ago. Because I still look at it. Now these have no Marini on them, which is different for me because, you know, that's what I do. But we're going to get a show at the, this really nice gallery. It's OTA in Santa Fe, New Mexico. Uh, Last year, was it last year or the year before? Yeah, just last year. Yeah, and uh, she asked me, the director of the, of the gallery said, uh, God, she saw, us, she was looking at my, my website, she goes, I really like those pieces, you know, can, you, can you do something, you know, like that for the show? And I did, and it's like, I, the whole concept was to throw out the Noah Fiore and just, you know, work with the carving and shape. And this is a human, bird, and bull. I call them. And that's all sandblasted. All right, now, now this is where my life gets weird. So I'm going through my middle age crisis. <laughs> and I was always interested in motorcycles as a, as a kid. And I remember in downtown Cleveland, you know, sitting in my dad's station wagon, and all of a sudden the Hells Angels came by. And I was like, wow, you know, these guys are the coolest thing ever. By. So I decided to get back into my roots and get into motorcycles. And I built this one from scratch, pretty much except for the motor, but I did I made the frame. And this is I got kind of involved with metal working. That's why I threw this in. I really got involved with welding and um, doing like out of body stuff and and uh, like, like I said, the reason for this is when I was a kid. I was really into this guy, and this is Big Daddy Ed Roth, and I collected his models, and I built a ton of model cars, and I was just enthralled by this guy. He was like, you know, and so, <laughs> so I went into this series. It's called the Hot Rod series, which these were basically just for me. They were fun. I really didn't care where they went or if I had to make a dime off of them or anything. I just had a lot of fun making these. And they're quite large, and you know they're. You can imagine pretty difficult to make. Oh. And they kind of grew and grew. That is over a two year period. This is Satan's perfume model. <laughs> <laughs> the glass fire and it's, you know, very spiky. I don't know if you can see it, but uh, I, gosh, I don't know if I should say this or not. It's, the Marini are pentagrams, like the Satan's 
<laughs> this was uh, about oil uh, with a dice on the bottom and a, it's a rubber hose. It's not glass. <laughs> Eightball, eyeball, glass vase. And I like this piece a lot. I still have it. Those are cue balls on the bottom of them. Is that like squeezing it? No, I guess not. Put the gear shift in the middle of it. It's not functional. Con ship. <laughs> I had a lot of fun making those. And they kind of went into these powders and sandblasting and carbon and you know, you have the flames. And these, these are kind of little interesting vessels that I made. Um, with the, the base and the, the parties on the side are like television sets and weird notes and it's kind of like modern day archival imagery. You know, go ahead. And I, I worked on the series on and off, but you know, this whole time you have to understand we're making the color field stuff. And, uh, and that's been my base for years. I've been actually making the color field series for uh, close to 36 years and it's been very profitable, which I kind of take, you know, it's, it's kind of makes me proud that I developed a, an idea back then that still sells well today. I mean, we, we, we can't make enough of them. I mean, it just, it's, it's become just like our base for funding, you know, our, our, our work, you know, and, which is a nice thing to have. <coughs> These little tower things. Chimney bottles. These were taken from when I was. Uh, I always had these memories when I was in Chicago because there's these two big uh, smokestacks kind of things. Uh, across the way from me was a, a Robbins Clay company, and they uh, they made uh, terracotta flower pots like you all use. You know, it's like they had these two big chimneys, and I really always liked that image. And uh, so I looked out the morning at the door of the studio every morning. And then I did these wall pieces. These were uh, put in a, uh, Northwest Mutual Insurance. I did a, uh, a few of these just for, for the walls. And these are the drawings that I started doing then. And the pastels, I still draw a lot, not as much as I used to. But same with the bottles, and I was doing these uh, kind of really obscure, I call them paintings, but they're actually pastels and crayons and spray paint. And, uh, but if you look, you know, the kind of off tilter, everything just looks like it's going to fall down. And, and I did quite a few of these just because you know, I was still searching. And that goes back to my original paintings when I was in school, you know. Perhaps I could put a timeline on these. These were pieces that you were making uh, like in the mid 2000s, was it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I didn't want to lose that whole painting thing, you know. It's like, they, you know, so busy with the glass or whatever. So I started doing these. And it turned into this. I had a one man show at the Prazzle Art Center, which is in St. Joseph, um, Michigan. Really, really nice. Uh, museum, and uh, they asked me to. The, the woman, and that's a long story, but anyways, I was doing a, uh, I was doing those drawings, and she saw some of the drawings. She said, you know, we were talking. She goes, you know, you should translate those to glass. I was like, well, okay. So I, I made this whole, this is what started this whole series, which went on for about four or five years. This is a wall piece. <laughs> And this is a dancing chair. But you can see like how my imagery from even college still goes on to this type of moving, very thin, spindly, kind of looks like a, a thing. Um, and that's the tablecloth. So I made these tablecloths that were draped over steel. So I'd lay those out, slump them, and throw them, you know, and then put them on the steel and slump them again. I'll know if you already. 
It's worth noting that these pieces are quite large. Uh, this one in particular is probably about eight feet tall. Yeah. How do you ship that? <laughs> it all, that's the thing, it all comes apart. It's, it's the mechanics of these are more fun as like goes back to the motorcycle thing. So everything unscrews and all the parts come off. And so you know, you're only, when you ship them, you're only shipping like a, you know, the metal stand and then the tablecloth and everything comes out and that piece of the flower stem screws into the base. And... So is it yellow? Uh, is that metal? The yellow part is metal mm -hmm. or glass? Uh, it's metal. Yeah, that's, yellow, metal. It's, that's metal. Okay. And glass is that, that, mm -hmm. and then the top flower and leaves. Okay. Mm -hmm. And they're kind of elusive pieces when you look at it in respect. All these metal pieces were made out of steel that was forged by West Senior, and then in addition to that patina to give it these various colors. And the colors would change over years, which was kind of an appealing thing when these were marketed. Um, in addition to that, the vessel work was made custom for it. One side note, like when Wes would design these slump pieces here, you would actually fuse pieces of, you know, latticino or millefiori or whatever the particular subject matter was, and then make a custom base that was the same size and shape of the metal that he had forged previously and then slump it, so each of these pieces were custom made for each piece. So it was kind of a matrix for the, the glass to slump on, mm -hmm. and then we take that and so I'd measure it, so he gave it just a, maybe like an eighth of an inch clearance. And the glass shrinks when you say, you know, there's a lot of complications with them. That was one of my particular favorite part of this body of work, is how like this, this metal piece would actually be screwed in to the base of this with two holes drilled out into each of the glass elements. So it kind of gives this real kind of elusive form of what Wes was talking about earlier, that it's always ready to fall over. It doesn't quite make sense from a... Uh, a gravitational standpoint of why it's but in actuality it's very very strong you could not so it's not fragile <laughs> <laughs> not at all okay so you can bump right into that it wouldn't even be a problem yeah. <laughs> really <laughs> <laughs> huh. i made a few smaller ones this one's only about three four feet tall tabletop ones It's a very popular series. I, I actually in a lot of collections. And I really enjoyed making them, but I just had to quit after a while. I don't know why. This is my absolute favorite. Um, it's a polished aluminum shadow that those uh, legs screw into, and that's what holds it up. So, like I said, the mechanics of it was fun. And from there, I, this piece was actually in the Bergstrom. It's the first one I did. Or you guys had it for some of the shows a number of years ago. And we did these uh, puppet things, I call them. And the same concept, but we did these figures. The figures are very difficult because they're all hot. And those aren't fabricated at all. I mean, we, you know, honey them in the butt. And they were really a lot of fun to do because you'd have this, and they're big. I mean, the figures are probably about like this big. So you're lugging this thing around. But the nice thing about it, when you heat it up, the arms would move and the neck would go like this. And they'd come alive, which was, which was great. And I'm just like, this is fantastic. Well, exactly enough on that, there's actually a video uh, somehow, I don't know how I made it on the YouTube, but there's a video of Wes Senior producing one of the figures for UW Madison, uh, circa probably 2010. If you ever get on YouTube and look up Wes Hunting, you'd be bound to find it. It's incredibly interesting. Yeah, but these are, these are super difficult to make. This, oh, is, this is the best one I've answered. <coughs> this is called Old Rust Bucket. It's about fishing in Wisconsin. <laughs> the boat should be wood. <laughs> Joe, I gotta get you in the mix. <laughs> so, uh, I don't know, I threw this in because uh, I want to talk about rhythm, which was my whole thing. I've been playing guitar since I was nine. And I'm a guitar fanatic. I collect guitars. So right now, I think I have about 16, which is just part of the collection. And a lot of them are antique and worth a lot of money. Um, but I, I, I really enjoy it just as much as I like glass or plant. Um, but this, this is just part of my collection. And uh, the reason I say that is because I got into these pieces, which I decided I want to do some wall pieces that created a rhythm. Um, and I think I was, they, they got better. This is an early one. I think it was the first one I made. Go ahead. But you have to look at 
the detail that's really interesting. And the nice thing about it in the background from the metal, you get the shadows, which I know a lot of people have done with just the metal. But with these, you get the glass too, so you get the color of the shadow, the reflection of the color on the wall, which uh, I would, it was very hard to uh, photograph. They're, they're a lot better in reality. That's, that's one of the flowers. And uh, I started looking at that and I kept on thinking of a row. And uh, so I started studying him and what he did. So I uh, kind of did my example in glass in these, you know, very Moreau esque. Again, super detail. And I like the viewer to walk up to it and go, wow, that's cool. <laughs> <laughs> This piece, uh, another incredibly hard piece of the thing. These are mirrored. <coughs> the spheres are, that's half the spheres, but all the silver ones are mirrored, which is really nice because when you walk by at eye level, you see the reflection, so the whole thing changes. Okay, so this was, um, I think Tom comes from my, my good friend Tom Philibon, one of my best class bowling buddies. We did a, I invited him out to my studio one time. It's like we were both kicking around the idea of doing some collaboration. And I always thought these pieces were very interesting. This was like, a, like 2012, I think, 12, 13, yeah. around there. So he came out to my studio and we fooled around with it. And then we went down to his shop and we did these, uh, go ahead. We did these pieces together. And uh, these are really interesting. They're done with copper wire, wrapped around a bubble, and then gathered over and then blown up. But what you have, and it's hard to tell from the slide again, but if there's like these, <coughs> you, ever, you know when you take a thing, a bubble, you know, when you were a kid and you blew the bubbles, you know? There's these super, what happened was there's these super thin, like paper thin, if you touched them, they break layers of glass in between each one of these. And there we are making those. And that, that was a great project, and it's always fun to be there in the winter. You know, he's from Tucson. I'm hanging with his studio down there. I mean, this is a really fun series that we did together. We probably did. And when I got back from that, I was inspired, so I went back to more traditional Mila Fiore, which is uh, laid out and rolled up and this is like this is like 2000 uh, this would be like 2014 2014, 2014 yeah. Yeah. so if you, these were these were kind of like you know the bean in chicago you know, yeah. the sculpture these are kind of taken from that form and i did do a lot of these probably about maybe 10 12 And taking Mila Fiori to the next level. Yeah. Yes. And from those, I started doing these towers. And uh, I wanted to do something that at that point I was thinking architectural, tall. And the main thing was like, that's the same pattern. You see that little sphere? It's polished on four or five, six sides sometimes. Okay, in the middle. Could you go back one? <clears throat> but if you look at the same pattern, but in miniature, and that's one of the great things about Mila Fiore, like inside that sphere, mm -hmm. there's that same pattern from the same marines because you can make them really small or you can make them really big. So I played with that concept for a while. These are, like I said, very architectural. I did a lot of these. They sold pretty well. All right, now we're going to get into something. We're getting there. So I guess it's a long way to do Every year, for the last 12 years, we've been going down to Key West, Florida. And a friend of mine asked, invited me, we're heading down there in a couple, a couple weeks now. But uh, my friend Jay Gogan invited me down there. He runs the ceramic department down there. And it's right in Stock Island, which is the next island, right next to Key West, which is what a nice place to be right now, right? Mm -hmm. So we go down there for a month, and we teach class boarding course. Well, Wes and I decided I said, if you could get the money, we'll go down there and build a, a glass shop so we can have this workshop every year. And Jay was all about it. 
So we built this small thing. We have these chickens running around <laughs> all over the place because it is Key West. There's Jay. Mm -hmm. he passed away a couple of years ago. He's my, my best friend. He built this sculpture. But anyways, that's something we do every year. It was like a just like a, a wonderful experience, and we, we still do it. And it's kind of like a paid vacation. You know? <laughs> There's some detailed shots of these pieces. This is more towards what I'm doing now. And uh, solid crystal with these uh, embellishments. And they're kind of like, you know, they take off everything I've done. Right? I kind of enlarge the marini. Now I make these marini one at a time instead of like pulling blanks over them and trying to force the whole thing. But I'm getting these incredible detailed elements inside, like similar to these pieces, which I'll move on to. Go ahead. These are early ones. I was shaving the glass with cork paddles when it was hot. And this is this is more recent, this is all in the last like four years. This is kind of like a presentation of how these developed to it. And at one point, those were all crystal. At one point I said it would be really nice to put color behind them. So or have the glass colored. So I, without building a color furnace and batching, which I hate doing, it's a lot of time, I decided just to do these overlays. So we blow a cup, figured out, I blow a cup of a very thin color and drop the crystal inside the cup while it's hot and then it's formed. I started working with two colors on the outside. So the cup has two colors? Some of them do. Some of them, the, the original ones had, had one, and I started doing two colors. And then I started doing black ones, with a black with a red interior or a white interior, or, and that's the cup, opaque. And then I started carving back, there, I was just talking to uh, John, and it's like you have these paperweights, French paperweights, mm -hmm. uh, that I really enjoy, always enjoyed looking at. I'm like, well, why can't you make those huge? You know, kind of thing. And they were really fun. You know? And I started, I was experimenting with that. I call these soup bowls because they actually do like a, look like a bowl <laughs> with something in there, right? I started carving the outside with sand, with sand blaster. And this is getting kind of into the current time here. This is all work yeah. that's been produced in the last year or so. Particularly these hard pieces. And a lot of these black pieces are very good. Mm -hmm. and I started stacking these kind of like the teapot. I mean, it was a show we had at uh, Santa Fe, nicest gallery in Santa Fe. It's right at the head of Canyon Road if you've ever been there. It's called OTA. Absolutely killer space. And I started, you know, okay, so at this point, <laughs> These are some of the ways I started carving just spears. I mean, that was the idea, just make a spear. And these are, you know, like this size, some are bigger. But I decided I don't want to make these monumental. I tried, it was just like, I think uh, uh, scale is not that important anymore. These are all recent, like in the last year, year and a half. And that's me and Wes, which we're going to be in a couple of weeks. <laughs> and that's it for me. Wes is going to talk about his work a little bit. Here's the brand of the operation. <laughs> All right, I learned from the best. It's one of those things. It's my son, Wes. Yeah, well, thank you so much, everybody. Yeah, I, know. Yeah, I know, this is one of my best. This must have been probably 2011, I want to say this was. You know what the great thing about this picture? If you look at the back, there was a water spout. Oh, so we, were, we were driving into it <laughs> just for fun. I thought you see one up close. So this is the middle of the Atlantic Ocean. We're like, see, oh, get closer, get closer. <laughs> uh, uh. That was a good time. Well, just a few, just a few words about the work that I do on Lauren Tan with my father. Um, as you can see, through about 30 years of 45, or excuse me, 35, 40 years of experience working with the class, he's had an opportunity to build quite a few bodies of work. 
Uh, as he was alluding to before, he produced the color field work all through his college years, the late 70s until the present day, and then in addition to that, produced uh, secondary bodies of work that either satisfied his own little artistic intuition or were more marketable pieces of particular circumstances at the time. And being raised in that kind of mentality of how to run your business as an artist, but also as a successful business owner, uh, I've learned to kind of approach my work in a very compartmentalized way like that. And so where I'm at right now, working with my father, uh, I'm 32 and I've been working with him for about 11 years, really the last seven years formally, the first few years being kind of like a, you know, on and out, early 20s, not sure I want to do kind of thing. May I uh, say this, uh, Wes was in the studio in the crib. Yeah. It's absolutely true, it's absolutely true. There were yeah, pictures I'm pretty much a single father, and you know, we used to drag him in there and he didn't live in a crib, you know. <laughs> so he knows the material. <laughs> And actually getting intimate with the material, uh, especially slightly getting out of high school around 2004, 2005, into the late 2000s, and I was gonna call it out before when he was showing the metal glass mix sculptures, the Still Life series, it was a particular part of the, the, the evolution he was at when I started participating in the studio. One of my very first jobs working for my father was actually doing the fabrication. He would design the work and then kind of show me how he taught me how to weld and he would kind of do these little kind of grunt tacking things together, you know, working in an anvil grinder all day, cleaning these things up. And that's how I got into the glass thing. Uh, kind of similar to the Hale Homestead story, you know, it's very much like kind of getting thrown under the cuff. It was a uh, summertime, I was going to Ripon College, uh, summer 2005. Uh, particularly, my father had had a falling out with an employee at that time. I think he had three employees, four. Um, uh, but you had a falling out, and I ended up, he was working on a body of work, the still life sculptures that need to be done really quickly for a particular timetable, and not having enough time to train or figure out what you're going to do with that. He got me in there working the angle grinder, and because it was a summertime and nothing going on. And that interest spilled into the fall. And I continued working with him while I was going to school at Ripon College throughout the winter. And then that following summer in 2006, I started realizing like, I don't really care what I was going, you know, taking poli sci classes I didn't care about. Uh, I was taking some art classes, ceramics, uh, I wasn't particularly interested. And I started getting into the glass thing. Uh, I started doing a little bit of uh, uh, classes, kind of supplemental art classes. I went to Penland School, uh, for uh, Penland School of Craft for a summer and all that. but. Point being, I decided to start working for my father and ended up growing myself into a building a little career for myself here in a little bit. And that career is kind of emphasized by the body of work that I'm doing right now. Uh, these pieces that I refer to as the Remnant Vessel Series. Um, this body of work is made in tandem of working production with my father. Uh, I work this kind of like, I was trying to draw a parody of, we both kind of focus quite a bit on producing color filled work at the pseudo production level, and then also kind of follow our more supplemental work on the side, and this is what I work on. Um, these pieces are pretty interesting how they relate with my father, because they're very in contrast to my father, and it's not really on purpose. I don't know if that's the inherent like father-son kind of clash thing. Um, I always like to show that, you know, Wes approaches his work from approaches his work from a very kind of surface decor, you know, artistic, you know, 2D aspect. You know, his surface designs are the name of the game and most of the stuff that he does. Whereas my surface designs are actually quite elementary and I put a lot of effort in kind of keeping the, the three-dimensional the, the three aesthetics in play of what makes the, my, my particular body work interesting. So I started working on these pieces with the assistance of my father, uh, teaching me how to coal work. Um, again, uh, coal working my father's work and I incorporate that into my work. Um, these pieces are these sculptures I produced by kind of making these kind of traditional low disc shapes. Um, this one you can really see where the parts come from. You know, I made a, you know, this hyacinth, uh, this um, uh, kind of a neutral gray in this lagoon, and then I cut sections away, removing these little kind of facet, little fin shapes from them. And then after that, I go through a process of bringing all the edges to an optical finish and then reassemble them either hot or using a, a UV a laminate or epoxy. And just to kind of supplement right around the thing, this is another thing that happens in our studio on the day to day. Um, this is a piece that's about 22 inches tall. Um, you know, kind of following the same flavor of my father talking about creating work that kind of has that off kilter feel to it. Um, I wasn't inherently interested uh, in, uh, uh, intrigued by the rock current kind of mentality. I've, I've had people today that they remind me of rock currents to kind of 
topsy-turvy kind of thing, but I have found that there is certainly parity there in the way that these kind of look very balanced, and that's the idea is almost making that they're not even stuck together at all, and that they could collapse at any moment. And I think that kind of, uh, that neuroticism emulates myself and my father, and I think that's a fantastic thing to show in my work. So just to kind of supplement the last few seconds here. This is the tallest one I've done to date. This one was 32 inches tall. I just want to interject. Um, I've always this, you know, when he first started doing, before he was, he was doing other stuff, but I, you know, I, I'm very proud of my son for the fact of not doing, I mean, it would have been easy to make my work or make work that looks like mine. And Wes, I think it was exceptional in the fact that he was like, now, what, 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 what would have happened is like everybody would have gone, oh, he's Wes Hunting's son. And I, I'm very proud of the fact that he took it to his own level, didn't copy my work, you know, which is really difficult when you're making my work. Or, you know, <laughs> 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 you know, I just gotta, I gotta give him kudos for that. It, it's like he, uh, he took his own thing to it, uh, his own level and stuck with it. And he's, he's you know, doing very well with this stuff. Thanks, Dad. <laughs> Well, I think I'm at a little bit here. I think that wraps up what both of myself and my father have to say about uh, our work kind of formally um, for the last few minutes here. If you have any questions or concerns or things you'd like to talk to. I know we kind of covered a lot of real estate here um, with images of the last little bit, but um, if you have any questions that you'd like to call out now, we'll certainly be mingling here for the next little bit. And uh, yeah. Um, when you're doing your work right here, what is interesting to me is how you're making those cuts. Are you just cutting glass? Are you using some kind of a saw? Sure, and I think what you're really into is the, the, like, the technique of scoring glass to cut yes, yes. uh, I don't do that, I, though it can be done depending on the thickness of the material. Uh, I tend to make these elements really robustly thick, like a half inch or more. Uh, specifically, from a structural standpoint, it's a hell of a lot easier to ship something when it's got a little meat on it, you know what I mean? Uh, I don't know if you can imagine trying to ship something that's you know, three feet tall and it's paper thin. It's a little neuroticism right there. So I keep them thick for that aspect. But furthermore, I've also found that keeping them thick kind of creates this lensing effect that is prevalent throughout the piece. Uh, again, you know, my father was talking about how it's hard to get these subtle nuances from images. Uh, but when you keep them, this one's really prevalent. When you keep it nice and thick, you can see the surface imagery actually come out lensing through the flat area here. You know, you can see this, this is very flat, very cut, and you can see that there's surface to go on the outside. But they are cut with a diamond saw. <laughs> yes, so with that being said, I find it a lot easier to use a diamond encrusted <coughs> circular saw, uh, water fed, and I use that to remove the sections away. Have you had your pieces at uh, Edgewood Orchard? Um, I used to deal with them years ago. My senior did. I mean, coincidentally, I'm personally working with a gallery, um, uh, Fine Line Design, which is over in Sister Bay, uh, not too far. Maybe that's where we've seen your pieces. Yep. Oh, very recently, yeah, in the last year or two, uh, just starting this, uh, maybe it was just last summer. Yeah, kind of thing. Uh, furthermore, you may have seen a mechanic K. Allen Gallery uh, a couple years ago. My father was originally working with Keith Clayton over there, uh, K. Allen, and I had some pieces there at some point. Okay, so we try to get around where we can, no doubt. So, ironically enough, a quick point on that, you know, going more into like the marketability of what we do in our business, you know, we're operating here in central Wisconsin, and aside from a handful, a couple like Door County, for example, we have a couple galleries that we work with on and off. Uh, we work with the Lakefront Museum and the uh, Madison Contemporary Museum of Art, gift stores, things like that. Um, other than these kind of small little pocket areas, we don't do a lot of business in the Midwest uh, so much anymore. Uh, West obviously operated like crazy in the 80s and 90s in Chicago. Um, but we find that given the inherent kind of, you know, tropical or, or oceanic feel of my father's work that we do very, very well on either side of the coast, um, particularly New England, particularly the Florida area, so we do, uh, do a heck of a lot of business. Yeah, we're actually in like, at one, one point I was in 110 galleries all over the United States, Japan, Europe, um, you know, we, we do, we're everywhere, you know. It was my, my, as far as marketing, we were, you know, I, I had a gallery in every major city in the United States at one point. Mm -hmm. And, it was and now, I, I mean, I couldn't keep up with that, so I mean, it, it kind of snowballed out of control. So now, that's, now we're in probably like about 10. And that's a point I'd like to bring up, kind of talking about your, 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 your heritage and the effort that you put in. 
you know, all the work that Wes has produced over the years, you know, you know, hundreds and hundreds, if not thousands and thousands of pieces, all kind of are, are feminalized in these, you know, different bodies of work. Wes was doing this while, in addition, running his business, and this means anywhere from taking off for the weekends to do retail shows across the country. Uh, you know, a typical year, let's pretend it's 1993, you know, Wes will be spending three weeks in the studio producing work, working 60 hours a week, then loading up the cargo van, driving out to Cherry Creek Hollow, you know, in Denver, doing a three-day show, you know, 10-hour days, 10-hour day, 10-hour day, then coming back, making work for a week and a half, then driving out to uh, Ann Arbor, Michigan to do that show, uh, coming back, you know, pounding out work as much as you can, and just, that would be the rhythm for, you know, eight months out of the year. And as, as Thurman Stadium once said to me, he goes, I was in New York City for a while. He was talking to Thurman Stadium, a really great artist, and he's very well known. And he goes, he goes, man, you're in the trenches, man. He goes, we, we, we wouldn't know what to do without you. Yeah. And I've started more art class art collections than I think anybody. <laughs> <laughs> One quick anecdote of that we did a show in uh, uh, the American Craft Exposition, which was a show that ran in. Uh, it used to be in Evanston, Chicago, and now it's in Highland Park. Um, it was a show that Wes did for years and years in the late 80s, early 90s, into the 2000s. Uh, then I'll kind of spare on that Wes kind of does to his business away from doing shows and doing galleries. But anyways, we went and did the show for, in this case, the first time in probably 12 years. This is probably 2015. And I had never done a show with my father in Chicago before, like actually being there in the flesh. And uh, not selling my work, but just actually being there. And I'll tell you, it was so intriguing to me how every single person that was interested, not just in our class, but art in general, would walk by and say, hey, I remember you, I used to see that time, or even furthermore, hey, we love our piece we bought back in 1992. <laughs> and it was like the last thing you want to hear when you're trying to sell your work. We just love our piece. You know? I wasn't gonna mention that part, but that's true. That, that, <laughs> that, that, that was, that was encourage them to get a cap. Yeah, exactly right. You know, that's the whole thing. You know. <laughs> They'll need a new piece yeah. soon. Yeah, exactly right. You know, get the cat. grandkids come over and I'll knock one down and get another one. <laughs> but it's, it's a fascinating thing when you operate at that level for years and you kind of get your, uh, you know, you're out there among the, your notoriety among collectors and things like that. It's crazy how you can, you know, really take over an area and that's what's the case because we're there for years and all that. So, any other questions? Are you able to describe how you get the colors in there? Sure. Uh, for me, uh, like for example, this particular piece, and to be clear, this kind of emulates from what my father would do with his work as well. Uh, we usually hand make <coughs> elements beforehand. Uh, for example, if you're familiar with Millefiori work or uh, anything like that. Um, so for example, imagine that you have three or four different, like just chunks of glass, these little bars of color, right? Uh, you would heat these up and then kind of layer them. Uh, imagine like a jawbreaker. Uh, you have a center that's blue. You have something wrapped around that that's a yellow, and then around that a red. And you have this this uh, this kind of large mass of glass with all these layers. You take that and you stretch it into a stick or a form or something like that, and then you can cut it into these little buttons. Now that's not what's shown here, but that's like the total crash course two seconds version of Millefiori. You'll see that in a lot of places all around the gallery. Uh, in this case, more simplified, these little threads or little kind of whole cane pieces, the same thing except for I just use an, an opaque color, in this case this white, and then in addition to that, wrap it in yellow and then pull it into a long thread, chop them into long sections, and then when I'm actually making the final form, I'll melt those into the surface and then cover them with clear, and that'll give me my imagery. Okay, so they're melted into the surface. That's yep. Kind of, I can yeah. picture how that happens. And it is super tricky, especially if you're not initiated with glass in general, because it does, you know, depending on the technique, it can very well look like it's painted on, uh, you know, or etched or different things like that. And it's kind of the, the mysterious thing about glass, it is all done with the, the single medium. And once you start losing, it's a pretty good. Oh yeah, it's really hot. <laughs> Talk about it all when we're doing these things in July. And it'll be a little more cranky, no doubt. <laughs> a lot of sweating. Oh yeah, oh yeah. A lot of pain, a lot of curse words too, unfortunately. <laughs> Any other questions? Cool. All right, well, thanks, everybody. This yeah, is great. Thank you.